Hey guys, welcome to your one and only lecture on perception. We spent all of that time talking about sensation and now we're talking about the top-down part of it all, how we perceive. Perception is our version of reality and it's agreed upon by most people. So don't go thinking that what you perceive is wildly different than others. Everyone's using the same sensory information and biology that runs off the same principles. So if I'm seeing green and blue, you're seeing green and blue. But here's where perception can differ. Is this person speaking excited, angry, passionate? How are you perceiving them in this snapshot? It all depends, and it depends on you. We're exposed to relatively the same situations, but our interpretations can be very unique. Perception is from top-down processing. We process and organize all of the sensory information that we get into a meaningful experience. So if your previous experiences are impacted by being yelled at a lot, your knee-jerk reaction might be that this is somebody who got really mad at their graduation. But if you're super excited and every graduation thing that you've looked at recently is people getting happy and joyous, well, then maybe that's how you're interpreting it. Did you just get yelled at or were they passionate? Now, the cool thing is that this is actually someone who is super excited about their graduation, but you might not see that the first time you look at it. Gestalt psychology we talked about ever so briefly at the beginning, and gestalt means the whole. This looks at the entire experience, not just what you smelled or what you heard or what you saw or what you felt, like physically, tactily. It's the whole experience, and that's what perception is. It's the whole. Gestalt psychology looks at organized patterns, how we perceive things, and that the entire perception is so much more important than the parts that make it up. We organize our environment into things like figure and ground, and we make connections between things that might physically not be there. The first thing that we'll look at with Gestalt is figure ground relationships. And for any of you guys who have taken photography, this is how you take a good picture. We organize things into what we're paying attention to and then everything else becomes the background. The figure is what stands out in our visual field and everything else is the ground. Here we're looking at a Coca-Cola can and what for me ends up being the figure are the flip-flops. But if you change your gaze to the word Coca-Cola, you see that maybe there's a hidden Coca-Cola bottle in the picture. It depends on what you look at. If you're looking at the flip-flops, the bottle disappears. And if you're looking at the bottle, well, the flip-flops become the background. Figure, it's often the object that stands out, usually in the center of your vision, and it draws your attention. The ground is everything else. So another way of looking at this is just saying, if you're looking at the can, regardless of the image on it, the trees and the bushes in the back are the ground. We group things visually. And again, with grouping, we're predisposed to group things in a very kind of understandable way. And we organize stimuli this way. So grouping, people are predisposed to organize stimuli into understandable groups. And we do it off of a couple of very basic principles. The first one is similarity. If it looks alike, group it together. I'm going to play basketball with my friends, and so everyone wearing light color or white t-shirts, they're one team, and everyone wearing dark or black color t-shirts, you're the other team. Very simple. We put the similar colors together. Proximity. Well, you guys have all sat in a class where a teacher said, mm, you three look like you're sitting near each other. You can be a group. Sometimes just how close things are to each other, we group together. Closure. This is like connect the dots. Often if there's a gap or a space between things, we'll mentally close it if we think that those things belong together. I'll give you a better example of this in a slide or two. And then continuity. We don't expect things to kind of break off and end at weird angles or to just change. We assume that movement continues in an unchanged pattern. So what do you see? Do you see rows? You should. How are you grouping them? Probably by similarity, color and style of food, and then also by proximity. All the apples are together, but all the green apples are with the green apples and the red apples are with the red apples. How are you grouping them? Well, here you have all of these boats at a marina and chances are, well, similarity makes sense. I'm gonna group the houses 
off on the side as, or the apartments off on the side as one group. And now I'm going to group the boats, not as they're all one large group of boats, but I'm going to do it by proximity. It looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six groups of boats. We have the rows or whichever way you want to do it, rows and then a column, or we have columns and then a row. But you see these large gaps and therefore you group them together that way. What about these cactuses? How would you group them? Would you want to group them by color or proximity? Closure doesn't work in continuity, not just yet. But you can see how you might want to put all of maybe the green containers together and the orange containers together and maybe the pink ones or maybe that's red. Or maybe you want to go by the type of cactus or but visually you have a desire to organize it a certain way. Here are examples of all of those grouping principles. First, you see closure. And I told you I didn't have a great example in the previous pictures, but here's a good one. What letter is that? It's definitely the letter G. You close off that figure, you connect the lines, you fill it in. Proximity. Well, all of the gray squares are together and all the black squares are together and you see the letter E. Continuity or continuation. Are those three segments of a white line or is that just one continuous white line that goes behind parts of the S? It's more realistic for us to see that as kind of like a white breadstick that's going in and out of the S. Similarity. If we looked at all of these letters and I said, which ones would you group together? Well, those two T's should go together because they're most alike. And with figure ground, within this one, you might see a tree or an arrow. I feel like it's an arrow, not a tree, in the letter A. All of these are grouping principles. Here's a closure illusion. So when we talk about a closure illusion, this tendency for us to want to close off figures, we also have a thing called subjective contours. Now, when I use the word subjective, I mean subjective means it's your opinion, your, your mind's interpretation. And a contour is a line. I'm telling you right now, there are no triangles and no squares on this slide whatsoever. Your brain is making the lines for you and it's doing it off of expectation. In the very first one in the upper left, it should be three black Pac-Man circles and some weird angles, and yet I see a bright white triangle. With the three Kiwi off to the right, there should be no triangle. There's nothing there, but I feel like there's a blue triangle sitting on top of the Kiwi. And the same idea of the four blue circles down at the bottom. It should just be four Pac-Man heads. But yet I see probably three circles with a white square put on top of them. And I feel pretty certain that there are lines there. But the reality is you can look at all of these pictures and do whatever you want to them. There is no line. Depth perception is our ability to see in three dimension and then also judge depth or distance. This was originally studied by Walking Gibson in 1960. They constructed a visual cliff and they were interested in when infants and young animals perceive depth. With young infants, they put them on the cliff side, really close to the edge, and asked their moms to call them over to see if they would come over the cliff. Most of the infants would sit there and get frustrated and stop moving and refuse to go over the edge, which made us think that this was probably inborn, innate, part of your biology. However, later research put children who hadn't had the experience with crawling or cruising, holding on to things and trying to move, just a little bit younger than the babies that were crawling and put them in the same position. And since they hadn't had the same experience with depth perception about six months worth, these children were much younger. They measured their heart rate. And if this was innate, those children should have had really, really high stress levels. Their heart rates should have been pumping like crazy because they would have felt like they were floating in air or afraid that they were going to fall. And the reality is, is they showed no response whatsoever. So, we learn depth perception through experience. The next thing we'll talk about for depth perception is binocular cues. When we're talking about binocular cues, we're talking about our ability to use two eyes to see depth. So the first one we'll talk about is retinal disparity. If you've ever played with a Viewmaster, you've figured out retinal disparity. 
The Viewmaster works by putting a picture into your left eye and your right eye, and the Viewmaster itself doesn't cause the three-dimensional image. It's your brain. In regular life, retinal disparity is experienced when you close one eye and then close the other eye and you watch images jump location. The jump is larger the further away an image is, and if the image is up really close, the jump is a lot smaller. This tells our brain the jump, the difference in the placement of the image between the left eye and the right eye, gives us an indication of how far away something is. The other binocular cue we have is convergence. If I'm sitting at my desk and I pick up my pen, and I stare at my pen, and as I bring my pen closer to my face, my eyes will converge. I'll go cross-eyed. It tells me, because of the muscles in my eyes tracking inward, that the object is coming close. Anyone who's ever hit a softball or a baseball, you always track the ball. You look fine when you're looking out, but as the ball comes in, your eyes converge in on the ball as it moves closer to you. It tells your brain how fast the ball is coming and how close it is to you. If you don't have binocular cue, if you don't have convergence, that's a really difficult, almost impossible task. Now, I have a wonderful nephew who I love more than anything, who actually was born with only a partial optic nerve in one of his eyes, meaning that he's legally blind in the right eye. He is a great football player. He was a wonderful wrestler. He is not capable of hitting a baseball because he can't do convergence. He doesn't have retinal disparity and he doesn't really converge. His eyes don't track in the way that they should because the messages don't make it to his brain. Now you might go, well, how is he a good football player? He wasn't a receiver, he played tackle. And yes, he can drive, but we'd have to spend more time in class talking about some other things like blindsight to explain why that's possible. So if you don't have two eyes for depth cues, you can also use one eye. Monocular depth cues are used heavily in art for us to determine that a two-dimensional picture actually has three-dimensional qualities but you can close one eye and still determine depth. So we use things that are relative. So the first one we know when we're talking about depth is something called relative size. If an object of known size, this is important, appears large, it's probably close to us. And if an object of known size appears small, it's probably far away. So everybody everywhere has taken some of these pictures holding up the Washington Monument or I don't know, holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, or in this case, putting your hand over the Eiffel Tower. Well, we all know that if that man is even of average height, he's probably about 5'10 to maybe 6 feet tall. The Eiffel Tower is far bigger than 6 foot tall. So of known size, we understand that there's some play with the, the images here. We know that the man must be closer and that the Eiffel Tower must be further away. But at first glance, this is just messing with that monocular cue. Relative height. We know that if an object of known size is far away, it's smaller, but we also know that it should move up in our field of vision. So here we have an older gentleman and uh, another gentleman, and we know that the gentleman with the beard is further away because if we were to draw lines right at the feet of their chairs, his is much higher up on your screen. If we bring him down and even on the horizon line, he looks itty bitty tiny tiny. In fact, even tinier than he does in the left picture, even though it's the exact same thing. So for us, that's another monocular depth cue. Objects that are further away move up higher in our field of vision. Relative clarity states that distant objects are less clear than nearby objects. Now here's the thing. We're gonna talk about something called relative texture or texture gradient, and they sound almost identical. What I want you to think of is driving out in the country near the mountains, and as you look out, the mountains appear hazy, but the road in front of you doesn't look foggy whatsoever. That's relative clarity, because light has to dissipate through more atmosphere to get to the trees in the far distance and then to your eye, it appears hazier as opposed to the thing right in front of you. So distance objects are gonna be less clear than nearby objects. Then you get to texture gradient, and this is where we get into detail. Nearby objects have really, really good detail, while further away objects seem smoother or have less detail. 
So if you look down at the carpet or hardwood or tile or whatever flooring that you're sitting on, or maybe even on your bed, you may notice that you can see the stitching in the fabric, the yarn in the carpet, the flex on the tile. And as you look further out, that detail goes away and all you see is maybe a color or a general pattern, but you don't see the detail. This is another monocular cue. You only need one eye to notice it, but close up you see lots of detail. Further away the detail seems to dissipate. Then we have something called linear perspective. All of you have done this. All of you were taught at some point in like middle school or somewhere how to draw with perspective. And this is the idea that parallel lines seem to come together in the distance. They seem to converge. But don't confuse this with the binocular cue of convergence. So parallel lines come together in the distance. So you know if you're going to draw uh, a winding stream going up into the mountains, the stream that's closest to you should be nice and wide. And as it gets further to the mountains in the distance of your picture, it should be moving up the page and getting narrower and narrower. Inner position is another one. And this one's really kind of hard to explain because you want to explain it using the words. An object that's closer is in front of or in a position in front of distant objects. Essentially, it's just that if something is blocking something else, with one eye, you can tell that it's closer. So I don't need to use two eyes to determine that there is a table that is slightly in front of the door. I don't confuse those two things. I just assume that the door must be further in the distance than the table that I'm looking at. Relative motion isn't something you can draw. So we're still talking monocular depth cues. It's not something that you can draw in a static place, but I can say that it has been artistically rendered. So if you have watched cars, and I don't care which version of cars you watch, but let's go to old school Lightning McQueen cars. If you watch cars and you remember Lightning McQueen going around the track, when the artists were drawing this, when he was on the far side of the track, it looked like he was kind of slowly going by. And the minute that he came up to the front of the track really close, it looked like he was going vroom, 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 really, really fast. So objects that are close to us appear to move really fast and objects that are further away appear to move slower. You'll also notice this if you are the passenger in a car and you look at the side of the road and the gravel seems to be going by super fast, but the trees seem to go by much slower. That's relative motion. Things that are close to us appear faster, things further away, slower. We organize all of this into what we'll call perceptual sets. So looking at the car below, is that a happy car or a sad car? The answer is it's a car, but you have an organization for faces stuck in your head. And so you see big eyes and a happy smile. And automotive manufacturers actually know this. And so if you look at a muscle car, it's supposed to have a much tougher kind of face, even though it's not really a face. They become very concerned about the headlight positioning and the grill in cars because they understand that we see faces in things. A perceptual set is our predisposition, our kind of want to, need to uh, preset to perceive something in a way and not in another. In other words, it's all top-down processing. It's often guided by a term that we'll call schemas, mental setups, precepts. A schema is a blueprint. And so we make blueprints for how we understand the world. Like I told you before, you see a face in this car and that's because we have a huge perceptual set a preference for faces. Perceptual sets happen everywhere. Another place where our environment heavily impacts what we see is in the Mueller liar illusion. If you're looking at that top segment or in A and B, which one appears longer? The line connecting the inward pointing arrows of segment A or the line that is connecting the outward pointing arrows of segment B. If you were to measure line A and line B, they're the exact same length in the top illusion and in the bottom illusion. It's because we live in a carpentered world where we use right angles everywhere. If you look into the corner of a room in your house, you probably will see some version of segment A in the corner. And if you go outside and you look at the exterior corner, you see B you're taking that information that you have constructed over your lifetime to tell you which one is longer and shorter. And the reality is they're the same. They ran this experiment with a group of people called the Zulus back in 1970 and asked them what they saw. And they almost universally got it correct every single time. A and B were the same length. 
but they had a very different environment. They didn't grow up in houses that were squares and rectangles. They grew up in circular homes or circular huts, and so they weren't impacted by this illusion as much. Here again is why you see it and other people maybe not so much. Those center segments are the exact same length. Given additional detail, it makes the illusion even more profound. The Ponzo illusion is another illusion that we see, and it's because we're using those monocular depth cues to give context to what we're looking at. So if I were looking at this, I would say it looks like I'm looking at railroad tracks. Well, I know that railroad tracks are parallel and they get narrower when they go further away. Linear perspective. I also know that the line that's lower is closer to me and lines that are higher up in my field of vision must be further away, relative height. So if those two neon green bars are present, the one that doesn't cross over the rails of the railroad tracks and is lower in my field of vision must be smaller and thinner than the one that's further away. If we take away the railroad tracks, you would find that those two neon green lines are exactly the same. We also get to perceive motion. Motion is perceived in two different ways, stroboscopic and what we call the phi phenomenon. Stroboscopic is when we perceive motion with rapidly changing series of images. So old school cartoons would be drawn on, would be one picture on top of another picture on top of another picture and we'd show them rapidly. That's stroboscopic motion. But for you guys, I know that a lot of you read Captain Underpants as kids. This is fliparama. Keep taking two images that just slightly differ and flip back between them and you'll see motion when motion isn't there. The phi phenomenon, however, it has to do with the turning on and off of lights. So it feels like the dots are shifting positions in the picture below, but the reality is they're not. It's just the lights are turning off. The dot is just going blue and we perceive motion even though motion isn't there. We have perceptual constancies, things that we determine to be constant in our world. Those are size, shape, and the color or lightness of an object. Size constancy. If you're walking down the hall, I don't assume that as you get closer that you're magically growing in size. I imagine that if you're a five foot seven woman at the end of the hall, you're gonna be small. And when you get closer to me, you will still be a five foot seven woman when you get closer to me. And then as you move away, I'm not gonna assume that you shrink. I'm gonna assume that it is an indication of distance and that you will still be the same height that you were when you were right in front of me. We perceive things as being the same size. I'm sitting far away from my classroom door right now. I'm not assuming that the door is gonna get bigger just because I got closer to it. I'm going to assume that it got bigger because it was an indication of motion. The door itself wouldn't grow. The size of the image of a person grows or shrinks on the retina. We correct that interpretation, not by assuming growth as the person walks closer to us, but we just notice that it must be an indication of motion. Shape constancy. I'm looking at a door right now and the door is not a perfect rectangle. In fact, we never see things like perfect rectangles in our world. They're always slightly askew, but we adjust for it. So it's technically kind of a trapezoid, almost like picture two. If I open the door all the way up so I can only see the edge, I'm not gonna magically assume that my door has morphed into a new shape. I'm going to assume that the door is at a new orientation. In other words, we assume that shape stays constant for pretty much everything except for maybe slime or liquids. Anything that is a solid object, we perceive to be unchanging. And then the other one that we'll talk about is lightness or color constancy. So I always do this in class and unfortunately you guys aren't here for me to play with it, but if we were sitting in class, I would walk over to the lights and I would find the person wearing the brightest sweatshirt or shirt in the room and I would go, what color is their shirt? So today I'm wearing a red sweater. And we would all go and agree that my sweater is red. Then I would turn the lights off and obviously the room wouldn't go completely dark and I would say, has my sweater changed colors? And you guys would all very clearly say, no, it has not. And then I would argue that in fact it has changed color. The amount of illumination coming off of my sweater to your eyes for your brain to process is less. So the color has kind of changed. But then I would turn the lights back up and you would go, nope, it's still the same red sweater. So instead of us perceiving it as actual color change, 
when we see an object that seems to change color, we actually see it as an indication of a change in the brightness or the lightness of the environment. Less light, colors get drab and darker. More light, they get brighter and clearer. What happens when we restrict some sensory information to the brain? What happens to our perceptions? Blakemore and Cooper looked at this in 1970. They raised kittens in a circular environment and didn't give them any exposure to horizontal lines. Now this isn't something you could do with humans, one, because it's massively unethical to mess with the perceptual sets or the brain growth of a human, but also with kittens, they go from infancy to adulthood in a matter of months where for a human it would be years. They raised the kittens without exposure to horizontal lines and what they found is that when the kittens became cats, they couldn't see any kind of horizontal line. Now students always wanna know what the, the cat saw. They never developed the cells in their brains that would detect horizontal lines. They're called feature detector cells. Those cells never developed. Because those cells never developed, the cats never saw horizontal lines. I couldn't tell you what they saw. They just saw nothing. So if a cat that was raised in this environment found itself in front of a set of stairs, it wouldn't be able to perceive the horizontal lines that we perceive that would allow us to understand where the rungs of the stairs were. George Stratton also did some research in sensory adaptation, and it's probably my favorite because we would get to play with the distortion goggles. Now he said that in some cases we can adapt to a displaced environment. Like what if we could wear glasses that put the ceiling on the floor and the floor on the ceiling, or glasses that moved everything in front of us 30 degrees off to the side. Would we adapt? And he constructed some pretty cool goggles, and by the eighth day of wearing his constructed goggles, he adapted to the new visually displaced environment. Now, he was able to show that humans can do this, but if we did this to squirrels or even your dog, they're not going to adapt, but we do. And he said, what we could also do is once we took the goggles off, it would take roughly about the same time for us to go back to our normal visual field, but that we can adjust, we can adapt to new sensory information.